Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're talking about the Oscars. Yes, the 94th Annual Academy Awards have happened. That's right. Finally. Uh, finally. Yeah, the greatest thing ever to happen to cinema has occurred. Uh, the award show that we look forward to every year here on Offscript has finally happened. And we're excited to talk about it. Uh, we got winners. We got losers. We got snubs. And yeah, we're going to talk about the slap. We got to talk about the slap. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, Andy, how can we not talk about the slap, right? Exactly. We gotta, the, I feel like we have to get in front of that. <laughs> the biggest sand- scandal since Envelope Gate. It's true. It's the, yeah, it's the biggest biggest scandal since Warren Beatty said, uh, God, La La Land won Best Picture when really it was Moonlight, right? That was the deal. Yeah. What year did that happen? Uh, that 2016 or so. 2016. Yeah. Were you watching live when that went down? No, I don't think. All right, I think I had like looked away for a second or something like that. Or I was like, like La La Land had won everything that night, and so we're like, oh, this is gonna win Best Picture, I'm sure. Right. Other otherwise, a moment when nothing cool would have happened. Uh, something cool happened. So you know, it is what it is. But uh, we're gonna talk about the Oscars. We're also gonna talk about this little little itty bitty movie on Hulu called Fresh. Uh, Andy watched it just a couple weeks ago, and I think we mentioned it on the podcast after we watched it. Um, but I took a look at it this week, and we're gonna talk about it a bit more. Also, gonna have a few words about Drive My Car. Uh, I got Andy to watch Drive My Car. It was a weird trade this week. Uh, so we talked That's about right. that back in episode. Yes, we talked about that back in episode one sixty six. We're going to talk about it a little bit more here, but if you want to hear uh, at least my full-fledged review, listen to this whole episode, then go subscribe to Offscript Film Review, and then roll back to 166 and check out Drive My Car. Uh, it's 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 good stuff. First things first, though, before all this small talk, we got to get to the news. And the first story this week, Matt Reeves' uh, deleted the Batman scene is making waves on the internet. Now, we can't show this and i can't really play it because believe it or not we started getting some copyright flags for our podcast but right, we, got too we big. can talk about it uh what is this deleted scene andy right so so matt reeves sent uh or posted a deleted scene quote unquote deleted scene uh which is about a five minute interrogation scene of the batman and uh the new with the new joker uh played by barry keown um, and it's real interesting because it, it's a page right out of Silence of the Lambs where the Batman is approaching the Joker to, with help uh, with finding the Riddler. And he he gives him a file. He says, what what do you know? What do you see? And, you know, and, and they do, you know, some of that like pr- quid pro quo where he's going to give him some information. He's going to help him profile. But he's also toying with the bat because that's what the Joker does. It's a fantastic scene. It's about five minutes long, which which was also really amazing. I do think this this is a piece of viral marketing. I don't think it's necessarily a deleted scene. It, it seems too long, and it doesn't. It would kind of take away, I think, from the main film. Uh, but it's pretty phenomenal, um, and I've definitely watched it a few times. It's it's a great scene. Yeah, it's an interesting release uh, for Reeves to drop after the film. But apparently, he's explained in interviews, at least to IGN, when he talked about it, like he very much he very much likes the scene. It's a really well put together scene. It's very Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, we have. Uh, Barry Keoghan's character, like behind glass, constantly out of focus. You never get a good look at him, but you can just see this this kind of disfigured shape back there talking to Batman uh, and Batman trying to get info on his killer. Take a look at this stuff. What do you think of this? I know you're nuts just like he is, right? What do you know? Um, It's, you know, a little bit like like Clarice Starling and Hannibal Lecter, and it's really good. It's really good stuff, Uh, but it's hard to deny it it would would have heavily distracted from the main plot. I think. Yeah, no one would have cared about the Riddler if that scene. Were yeah, there. if if I didn't know any better, this this the scene's fully edited with music and color correction, and everything. So like, it seems like they cut this very late in production. If anything, maybe they ran it in front of test audiences, and test audiences wrote on their little cards. They had a movie like "Wanted More Joker." <laughs> <laughs> like all I could think about was this scene. Um, so so you know, a bit of a bummer. It's not in there, but it's it's cool. We can see it, right? Yeah, it, and it it takes things in a in a different direction, you know. It's it, after Chris Nolan's movies, it didn't seem like Batman could get darker or grittier, but he, here we have, and we have a Joker who is heavily scarred. You know, w- one of the the mythos of the Joker is that he falls into a vat of chemicals, and that's what turns him crazy and turns his skin white. Uh, and so we have that Barry Keoghan's version is this semi disfigured like he looks like a burn victim I mean, he's, he's got like acid scars all over his arms all over like he's just got like tufts of hair um you know it looks like someone who's been in a fire and so they're they're taking that cue very you know just they're going in, in a really interesting way also 
this is this is a Joker who has already been captured and who's that you know him and Batman have an established relationship already. It's not like the Dark Knight where it was like a new introducing this new villain. Um, you know, he it's like you know you and me we've been at this for a while. And Matt Reeves made a comment that this is actually kind of like Joker before Joker. This is before he's like full fledged. You know the person he, he is. So hope, I assume we'll see more of him in a sequel to come. Yeah, um, it's a chilling scene, and it's really well put together. You should go check it out. It's available on YouTube. I'm sure IGN's got it floating around. A bunch of people have reposted, so if you can find it, try to watch it from the official Warner Brothers channel. It's going to be the best quality. Um, so far, the Batman has made $411 million at the box office. Keep an eye out for the Penguin series follow-up on HBO. Um, keep it on off script for more about the Batman. Uh, the next story we have, getting into the Oscars, because we got it. That's uh, that, Look, that was big news this week. That, that was this is what going on the oscars ratings <laughs> we'll get to the we'll get to the drama in a second but first <laughs> for great. a moment we got to talk about who was watching the oscars because every year they're trying to get more people to watch the oscars every year they want more people to watch the academy awards andy how did they do this year a lot better than last year you know the uh the headline is that oscars have uh rebounded from by 50 60 percent from last year well w- when it's the v- worst viewing of all time that isn't as good as it sounds. So last year, uh, they had about 10 million, 11 million viewers, which was an all-time low. And uh, this year, they came in at about 16. So that that is a huge jump percentage-wise, but that's still really low. The Their pre-pandemic numbers were about 26 million. Um, and their peak, I think, around the early to mid-2000s would have been about 46 million. So huge. I mean, they've been declining for, for a while now, for, I mean, probably the last 10 years. And they... Uh, really bottomed out last year, p- primarily because of the pandemic. So a lot of that is pandemic recovery. It's going to be slow, but it's, you know, it, it's not a great recovery. Uh, there were some attempts to make the show smaller this year. Uh, every year, it feels like the Oscars are trying to do something new to kind of bring people in, keep them hooked, and also, you know, address common broadcast complaints, which are it's too long, it's boring, nothing exciting happens. Uh, last year, they had the director, Steven Soderbergh, uh, helm the show. This year, I don't know who was at the front of it, but uh, they cut a handful of categories to f- film before the broadcast and then run edited versions of those acceptance speeches during the broadcast. Um, they did that to, I think, six categories, like sound and sound editing. Um, and I, I think film editing was the big one that people were upset about, like how are you going to hide editing in, in, in a pre-broadcast, but whatever. Uh, the show is still a half hour longer. It was, it was just short of four hours this year. It was like three hours, 42 minutes. Like last year it was three hours, 18. So what's like, what's going on? Well, <laughs> you, I, I you guys think are cutting categories, trying to make it shorter and it's still longer. Like what's up? Yeah. They made those categories go by faster, but then I think they just probably stuffed in more commercials. Cause that's the thing. I, I remember looking at the clock and it was like, you know, nine forty or or something, and they had four or five categories left. It took them over an hour to do like the last four big categories. So it seems like they're really just trying to shove as many commercial breaks in there, and uh, really, I mean, they're stretching it out for money reasons. And I mean, they got to get the show under like to three hours. Three hours would be fine. That would be perfect. Yeah, I I have some theories as to how they could do that, and also to get more people to watch the Oscars. I'll lay out my opinions, and Andy, I want to hear if you have any. Uh, dissenting number one they need to probably bump the show up to afternoon right like bump it up an hour or two like make it more of a midday evening thing um you know make it a bit like the super bowl right like i know super bowl can often run in the evening but um i think it'd be a little bit more accessible if people are going about their day like right out of church on sunday and they're like oh hey oscar's starting an hour you know um well it still something. starts at it starts at 5 p.m pacific not so early enough so it's still like <laughs> start it's just noon. so long yeah it is long. Yeah, it's it's they, they struggle to keep it under four hours, it seems, each year. Uh, number two, God, they've got to show more exclusive movie clips or like exclusive trailers, right? Like you think of like the cool ads that run during the, the Super Bowl. Like it'd be cool if the Academy Awards did that for movies, right? Like you're going to see exclusive trailers you can't see anywhere else or Netflix will drop some cool movie same day on streaming. They'll just advertise it and now available like the Cloverfield Paradox. Not a great example because the movie wasn't good, but I mean, just make it more like, you know, exciting for film people. Like those are going to be the people watching the thing uh, and they just don't seem to have the, have the ability to do that. 
I, I think you got to pick a little bit more relevant films. I mean, I know the Oscars is supposed to be kind of a celebration of cinema as an art, not necessarily about box office, but you know, Spider Man should have had more recognition because it was the film that saved cinema. It's made more money than anything in the last two years. Um, and it, it was kind of nowhere. The other thing, great movies like, you know, The Green Knight, which I think would have had a lot of interest, were completely absent. And then a whole bunch of things that no one has seen that no one's really excited for or talking about. Because, you know, that's in the old days, that's, that's how around Oscar season, there'd be like, oh, this great movie that no... You know, you may not have seen or heard about it. It's got a lot of buzz. It's really great. You got to see it. There's none of that. There, there's none of these indies that that I've heard about that are like, oh yeah, it's it's it'll change your life. It'll change your mind. It'll like nothing. Yeah, it's um, you know, and we're coming out of a weird year at the movies. That's that's the other thing worth mentioning. Uh, you know, th this last year or so has been primarily dominated by films at the box office that are going to be angled towards male audiences because younger male audiences are the people going to see movies, right? Older folks, they're staying home because of COVID. Uh, a lot of women are not coming back to the movies. In fact, we just saw some success with The Lost City coming out last week, getting $30 million opening weekend. That was like a blowout for 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 women's films because uh, they're not doing that well right now. So a lot of the movies from last year were either nostalgia properties, right? Are there going to be stuff that are aimed at dudes like Dune or Spider-Man? Um, those are the things that did particularly well. So in a lot of ways, those start to dominate the conversation regardless. Yeah. The, like the, I think the Oscars, um, I don't know. I think they need to narrow their scope a little bit or maybe widen it. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, a little uh, about one. And then there's yeah. some things like, uh, you know, I'm just looking through some of these best picture. I mean, like nightmare alley is a great film. It just came out at the wrong time. It came out the same day as, as Spider-Man no way home. There was no way that was going to, you know Doom. it got completely overlooked uh but then yeah. you have th but then you got weird things like don't look up which i actually think a lot of people saw but it was a kind of mediocre film and surprised. nobody liked it yeah yeah I mean, so on did, the nose but... ham-fisted dune i think dune's a great example of kind of both ways of it's it's a blockbuster kind of film but it's it's got a lot of great filmmaking and it did go on uh, to win a lot of awards which we'll talk about later uh it's some it's of these other ones though it's like Belfast, we couldn't see that. We tried to, like Hirsch Pizza, same thing. Yeah. Um, and then this, this kind of some miss is uh, West Side Story just didn't really catch any any buzz or any legs, and you know I thought it was a really good adaptation. And same yeah. thing with like uh, King Richard, and a lot of people. The one film people were talking a lot about was uh, The Power of the Dog, um, which was available on Netflix, and we saw it. Some, I mean, we did this an episode on it a while ago. True, um, but that film kind of had some of its own issues that we'll get to get into later. So it's it, it's a weird choice uh, of some of, the, of that they're making. Like they're picking some films that they think everyone's going to be talking about, and they're like I said, like don't look up, but no one really is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like I said, somehow they they seem to always be stepping on toes. It's like what, what is do. this list? <laughs> I know. Well, well, we'll we'll get into the list shortly. But before we get there, we have one more story we got to cover. Will Smith smacks Chris Rock at the Oscars. <laughs> so, Andy, for anybody who hasn't heard, uh, do you mind? I, I can explain it, but I feel like it's it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to tell the world what's the, what's going on in this story. So, do you want to do you want to take the reins on this one, please? Do sure. I and I wasn't I wasn't watching at at the time, but uh, someone someone next to me was like, "Oh my gosh, this thing just happened!" And I was like, "What?" And then I like ran to the Twitter to get <laughs> to see the footage, but uh. Uh, yes, at one point towards uh, the end of the night, uh, Chris Rock made a joke about uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and uh, Will Smith walked on stage and slapped him pretty hard and then walked back and yeah. then had some choice words afterwards. And uh, it was bizarre. Like at first people thought it was a bit. They thought it was uh, staged maybe. Um, but the more like, you know, the more footage came out, some uh, some of the unedited uh, or uncensored versions came out. No, he really hit this guy over uh, a remark he made, and it was, and then, yeah, it was just bizarre, a bizarre situation, um, and that's what's happened. And then, and then there's kind of been the fallout. You know, uh, Will Smith has since apologized for his actions, um, but it's still it's bizarre. I mean, you had physical violence at this award show. Yeah, it 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 was really strange. Um, this happened about an hour before the end of the show. Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> Will Smith is nominated for Best Actor, so he and he and his wife are sitting front row. Uh, Chris Rock is up doing his thing, tell, telling a line of jokes like for for the Academy Awards, and one of our uh, uh, lead nominees stands up, walks across the stage, and slaps him, walks back, and then screams at him twice. And it was weird because, yeah, when you watch the clip, uh, you can hear them and you can find it on YouTube. It's on yeah, Facebook, Twitter. It's floating around. I promise. Uh, if you unless you've been living under a rock, listening to nothing but old off script episodes, you've probably seen it by now. Uh, but in case you haven't, um, it's a weird clip because you can hear everybody in the audience like kind of like you can hear them kind of be surprised at first. But everybody, for the most part, claps through it and cheers through it or whatever. And then when Will screams the first time, they definitely start to quiet down a little. And then after the second time, which is really aggressive, that's that's where everybody starts to get weird. And you can yeah, see the uh, actors and actresses <laughs> in the background starting to like their faces Lupita. drop and everybody's getting their phones out like, oh, my God, this just happened. Yeah, the uh, crazy Yango was like right behind him. And she's like, oh, my gosh, uh, yeah. this is happening right now. And yeah, so obviously, obviously for, first off, physical violence is never okay the answer especially for someone that's essentially you know trash talking and you know chris people have criticized chris rock as well and he did make an you know kind of on off color and sensitive joke but that's also what comedians do that's what they're paid to do like i mean how is ricky gervais still alive after like the kind of jokes he makes at these these things like he skewers people absolutely um yeah and yeah it's god yeah, so it, it's just it was a strange reaction. It's it's almost one of those things where someone flips out, and it's usually about something completely unrelated to the thing that to like the straw that uh, breaks the camel's back. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It's it's just a really weird energy, and it's weird coming from our man Will Smith because Will Smith is normally such a, a a positive force on the internet, right? I know he's on Instagram, he's got a TikTok account, um, and he's usually very much like spreading kindness and positivity. So like, it was really weird. It was really weird. Um, it blew up shortly after everybody was talking about it. Um, the hot the memes are so good. Kid. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I wish we could share them on the show. We won't. Um, you know, we we could just kind of talk through it. But anyway, uh, uh, it's weird. Like I, I was telling Andy last night, I was scrolling through my Twitter account Sunday night. Like you could see on my Twitter feed, like lightning strike at the moment it happened, and suddenly from then on, it went from like just kind of mumbling Oscar talk on film Twitter to like all anybody was talking about was the slap and whether or not it was real and hot takes and opinions and calls for him to be ejected from the theater and other people say Chris Rock was wrong. Um, it is nuts. This has been the thing people have been talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's still and it's talking such, about it today. It, and it's such a shame because Will Smith would have to get up on stage within an hour and give a speech uh, accepting an award. And he looked like he was having a freaking out of body experience trying to simultaneously thank the Academy for the award and then <laughs> deeply apologize to everybody for making himself look like a jackass. Like, really weird, I, man. He, I, yeah, he's I crying. I haven't watched that yet. I should, I should and he's watch a, that. I haven't seen he's it a yet. vessel of love. Have you really not? No, I haven't watched the whole thing. I've watched bits of it a few times. It just sounds it's, too like I, too cringe. I, it's, like, too, I can't. it's too cringe. Yeah, I can't. Like it's too. I, I can't watch this guy who just smacked somebody and shouted at them. Like suddenly get up and, and give like a tearful thanks. And like I, I shouldn't be that way. That's that. That's not growth. But since then, he's apologized. Uh, he got on Instagram what Monday, right midday and said hey i i'm sorry chris rock i didn't mean it you know he apologized he apologized profusely at the time to the academy and nominees not chris rock um is he coming to the oscars next year andy i mean what are we yeah i think well so this is this is like you know it's a pr nightmare uh you know and De denzel yeah. washington got out there and said something about you know the devil comes after you in your, in your best your, moments your highest something. yeah yeah, trying to do some damage control. Uh, there's a, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some fallout for Will Smith specifically. You know, you, you uh, it's a bad, it's a bad look. Um, you know, and you think of, I think of him most recently as like from, you know, Disney's Aladdin. Uh, you know, he's he's a very kind of family oriented, you know, entertainer, and so uh, that I mean, there might be some fallout for him. Uh, also, the the academy is trying to figure out what to do. They're, you know, they're not going to like strip his Oscar or anything, but they're they got to do something. They feel like they got to do something. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it it. But you know, he's a wealthy and very famous celebrity. It, 
it's it's not going to be too bad. He'll be everyone will forget, and it'll be a meme in a year or so. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Like ultimately, Chris Rock didn't press charges, and it is damn good television. Obviously, um, some people have said the Oscars made this a bit. This isn't even real. Um, I doubt that. I really do, because it would be the smartest thing the Oscars did in two decades. So I, I don't think it's, that's it's, real. Yeah, but it's too smart. There's no, it's too clever. Yeah. Uh, but um, this will be stuck on him. Th- this will be a thing, I think, in the future. Like when people talk about Will Smith, there will be people in the comments oh, yeah. dropping I mean, slap pe- memes like, people for re- a remember- very long time. Yeah. Yes. I mean, th- people remember this for the next 20 years. Easily. Yeah. People, I, and it, yeah, and it's going to be attached to the Oscars. But, you know, people are going to say for for years, now wasn't as good as 2022, and then the slap picture. Like, just I mean, if you're if you're watching on us on Facebook, it's it, it says it all. Like, we added it up. It's just <laughs> like it's just it's just so egregious. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, um, yeah, Chris Rock is going to have material forever. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it. Uh, bummer, bummer. I'm 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 bummed for Will Smith, and I'm bummed for Chris Rock, and I I think this was a not a great move uh just all around but good television again and speaking of good television we should move on to our formal review of the most exciting night in cinema (laughs) ever in in the history of cinema andy you want to uh do the honors time for our 2022 oscars recap so uh the oscars were sunday night uh some surprises some not surprises obviously (laughs) the big talk is the the slap but we're here to talk about the awards themselves the winners the losers and kind of how everything played out uh there's kind of ton to go through uh we'll try to go through this uh we'll just do every other one we'll start with best picture and a huge surprise uh the movie coda won best picture uh we haven't seen it i've maybe seen part of a trailer and i i think i've heard a review about it and all i know is that the, the premise is there's a uh a family of two deaf parents who rely very heavily on their their child who is not deaf um and that child begins to have a successful music career has the option to like go on tour and this would require leaving his parents and so it's a big uh you know family drama about like well i want to stay and you know my parents need me but i also have this opportunity and that's all i re- really know know about it I've heard it's good. Big surprise, though. Uh, This is a movie from Apple Films or from Apple TV Plus, I guess. The first streaming film to win Best Picture somehow beat Netflix to it. Because Netflix has been trying hard to win a Best Picture. They sure Um, have. uh, So we definitely have to watch it now for the show at some point. I have heard it's good. I have not heard it's great. So it's a surprising pick. Everyone's money was on Power of the Dog or Belfast. Yeah, uh, I didn't see Coda. But I know a couple of people that did that I talked to, and they said it was really, you know, middling. They were like, "Yeah, it's heartwarming, <laughs> it's nice, but like, it's a bit hallmark, and like, ah, eh, you know." And I just thought, out of the nominees this year, there were so many stronger picks. And like, I know I haven't seen it, but like, I also have heard nothing about it. like nothing exciting. Nobody's talking about it. Like, you know, movies like Dune or even Power of the Dog, Nightmare Alley, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, Licorice Pizza, West Side Story, King Richard, Belfast. All of them, all of them seem like more prominent picks. And I'm not going to say picking an underdog is bad. It isn't. Last year, Parasite won. I didn't think Parasite was going to win. I was very excited. Parasite won. Um, Last year but was this no, one just... Nomadland. Yeah, I get I, right. I, I'm sorry, year before. Uh, yes, last year was No Mad Limb, which I also like. Um, you know, I guess I need to see Coda and and change my tune a little bit. But I, yeah, admittedly, I'm a little bummed because I just thought there were so many, so many others that would do that would probably be in front uh, that I'm surprised it didn't well, actually happen. I, I read an interesting thing about you know the voting. First of all, there's a preferential voting ballot for Best Picture, and I guess you list your your favorites um, in order, but also. Apparently, the the critics worry about how they the films relate to audiences. Um, and the power of the dog is a very it's very cold, kind of uh, profound neo western. It's very slow. It's not super accessible. It's how many? Of those, oh, how, how many? How many Academy Award critics do you think were on their phones watching on Netflix at home? Like they were just. <laughs> That first hour, dude, is brutal. If you're watching yeah. at home, uh, Power so, of the Dog, it's really so hard you. To so when your choice is that, or, or something like Coda, which is like it's it's a family film, it's heartwarming. Is again, it's very saccharine and hallmark. It's well, you know, that's a little bit more of an audience pleaser. So that in that that sense, it's not surprising. But um, 
and again it's a film that, that features several prominently uh you know deaf actors so that's it's a lot of progress in its own way and those are good things but um yeah i've heard the film is kind of weak and if if you're going to pick a film like that last year's uh sound of metal is the uh the film that i would choose of about you know a deaf protagonist you just really like Sound of Metal. It's um, so good. It's so I good. haven't seen Coda, but I, I agree. I, I did think Sound of Metal was very good, even if it, it hit a little too close to home for me. Uh, all of these are winners in my heart, but of course, only one can be the winner of the 94th Academy Awards. So congrats to Coda and congrats to the team. We will have to watch it. Shoot, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Andy and I watch it and we're completely like blown away by what's going on in it. But it just, it just seems like it hasn't had a lot going on, and that's okay. Uh, our next category, best actor, goes to <laughs> Will Smith of her King Richard. <laughs> how awkward. Other nominees. Oh, how awkward. Other nominees included Javier Bardem from Being the Ricardos, Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom, Benedict Cumberbatch for Power of the Dog, and Denzel Washington for The Tragedy of Macbeth. Um, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> First off, outside of the slap, right? Like, just as, as a category here, as the winner... I think Will Smith was one of the, I mean, he was a front runner for sure. Like I, I felt like a lot I of people said, said this, he might take it. Yeah. I said this last week. I said, Will Smith might win because he's Will Smith and he's a Hollywood institution and he hasn't won the big award. And so he's kind of, he's just kind of due for it because of his, his career. That and sounds like something behold, I would uh, Yeah. Go ahead. It doesn't. No, no, you didn't. You didn't believe you didn't believe in me, yes. it, which was fine uh, because, <laughs> but he still won. Uh, I mean, Desa Washington was, was fine. Uh, I heard Andrew Garfield was phenomenal in Tick, Tick, Boom. I, I didn't see it. Uh, you know, The Power of the Dog got, had 11 or 12 nominations. I didn't see uh, Being the Ricardos. I heard it's kind of bad, but I heard yeah, that Javier Bardem is good at it. I need to see Tick, Tick, Boom, and I guess Being the Ricardos. I'm not too anxious to see that one. But but of what we saw, which was King Richard, The Power of the Dog, and Tragedy Macbeth, yeah, okay, I, I'll take it. I honestly thought Benedict Cumberbatch might get it. I thought Will Smith as Richard Williams was good but i just i kept i don't know i i I don't know i I thought he could go a little deeper yeah and andrew garfield's like singing and dancing and he's not a a singer by trade so i figured maybe he'd get one he's young he's in the new spider-man like i don't know but uh, it just goes to show it's not it's not a popularity contest or at least maybe it is a popularity contest and i just don't know who's popular but uh andy andy was spot on the money yeah i I, I was totally a naysayer last week i was like nah that's dumb that's not gonna happen (laughs) so you know whatever uh andy best actress you want to dig in yeah here? Best actress went to jessica chastain for uh, the eyes of tammy faye baker uh or the, the eyes of tammy faye uh i've heard that that she is great in that movie but that the movie itself is just kind of mediocre but uh a real standout this is another award i think it's kind of a culmination because she's just been in so many great films over the years uh also other nominees were olivia coleman in the lost daughter which we did review Kristen stewart for spencer nicole kidman for being the ricardo ricardos and penelope cruz for uh parallel mothers um not not surprised I, she was kind of the front runner I, I felt like the field was a little weak this year yeah i i like i said last week i'm almost ashamed of how few of these we've seen uh the only one we watched for the show was the lost daughter uh eyes of tammy faye is currently available on hbo i really would like to see spencer but i think that one's not really floating around uh i haven't seen it anywhere like it's about the, it's about the same guy who did the uh jackie o uh yes yeah with, from a couple of years with ago. natalie portman right yeah mm-hmm. Um, but now I heard great things. And yeah, I don't know. I was hoping, hoping Kristen Stewart would get it from a long shot. And I didn't see Parallel Mothers. I'm going to be honest. It was showing at a couple local theaters. I just. <laughs> I honestly, feel like Pe- Pe- Pedro, Pedro Almodovar sneaks in here every every year or every other year. Yeah. Honestly, I think of knocking out Parallel Mothers. I didn't like the poster. Sometimes it's all it takes. Sometimes just a, a, a weird poster will knock you off a movie. Uh, I know a lot of people aren't going to go see everything ever all, all at once for the same reason because they got a weird poster. But uh, either way, congrats, Jessica Chastain. I hope she I hope she keeps getting work. I know there's a there's a history of, of people winning these awards and kind of falling off the map a little bit. So um, I know she's still producing. I think she's getting into directing. Right. So like, hey, good for her. Shoot. It, it's not easy to, to, to win an Academy Award. Uh, what do you want to cover next year? I will just keep going and see if we can go through them a little uh, quicker. Uh, All best right, yeah, yeah. Well, here, now that we're through the quick and fast ones, yeah, go ahead. Uh, best original song went to No Time to Die. Uh, Billy Billy Eilish and uh, Phineas O'Connell for uh, No Time to Die, uh, which actually came out, the song came out a while ago, but because uh, everything got delayed by the pandemic, it's just finally got around, around to a war season. Other um, 
nominees were uh, Dos <laughs> Oruguitas from uh, Encanto. Uh, somewhat, somehow you do uh, down to joy, which I don't know what movies these are from. <laughs> be alive and down down to joy. Yeah, they, these not very mem- memorable songs. Uh, no time. I mean, no time to die was the big winner there. That, that's not really a surprise. It's it's notable because uh, the song from that, that really I think took off lately was we don't talk about Bruno from Encanto, which is also Lin Manuel yeah, Miranda. Song. Yes, uh, so big that they performed it at the Oscars with the cast and Megan The Stallion, um, but didn't get nominated. It's like you guys are going to perform it on stage, singing and dancing, but you didn't even bother throwing it a nom. Like it's like they knew. It's like they knew we we missed this one, so they they got all the clout from it, but didn't actually bother nominate but uh, hey no time to die it's a solid track uh you know but billy Eilish isn't always singing positively so it's actually nice to hear her and phineas working on something that's a little uh uplifting even though it sounds kind of depressing but you know it's, it's a solid track again uh best animated feature sorry again next best animated feature uh went to encanto from disney other nominees include luca from disney ryan and the last dragon from disney the mitchells versus the machines uh and flea which was a iranian film i think mm-hmm. um, also so about flea he was also nominated this is kind of incredible for best international feature and best documentary mm-hmm um it's That's very pretty se- outstanding yeah for an animated film so it's and it's, it's a very serious film um which i think we will if we get a slow week we definitely should should watch i think it's available we should now. yeah yeah yeah. Um, um, yeah it shows up in some other categories not which is rare for an animated film yeah i'm not surprised by encanto winning um i don't mean to say best animated feature is basically a disney vehicle at this point but like they almost consistently have over half of the nominees every year so it's hard to deny like they are well it's like you very said they much le- swinging for these they leave out all the anime films that come out every year yeah that jujutsu kaisen movie's not in here like weathering with you was a huge movie two years ago and like that didn't get nominated like it it's a weird movie it's weird you don't see anime in the animated feature category just just Something to think about in the future. I don't know if they'll change that, but you know. Uh, any thoughts? You want to bounce, bounce down to best director? Let's go down to best director. Do uh, it. The big winner, or one of the big, oh, big awards of the night, uh, best director went to Jane Campion for The Power of the Dog. The only win for that movie out of like twelve awards. You know, everyone thought that that w- that movie might sweep the whole thing. And again, that's part of what usually happens. Usually, there's a lot of buzz about the the movies that end up winning, and this was probably the the one that had the most. Uh, this, uh, this is the second win for Jane Campion. She also won for the piano back in the 90s. Uh, other nominees were Kenneth Branagh for Belfast, uh, Ray Suke Hamaguchi for Drive My Car, uh, Steven Spielberg for West Side Story, and Paul Thomas Anderson for uh, Licorice Pizza. Um, yeah, Jane Campion was a front runner for that. She's all anyone talked about. I'm surprised. How is Paul Thomas Anderson on this list at all? Like, Did anyone see Licorice Pizza? A lot of people on Twitter saw Licorice Pizza and they think it's either brilliant or racist. I haven't seen it, um, but, you know, I'm excited to watch it at some point point. talk about it on the show. Um, you know, for the categories, I really thought Steven Spielberg might take it. Uh, as much as I was kind of middling on West Side Story, it was really brilliantly shot and it's really well put together, even though it's a remake, like there's a lot going on there. I think, uh, the, yeah, the, the I think the big issue with West Side Story is it was a bomb. It just, and yeah. the, the, the Academy doesn't, they don't necessarily want, like to reward films that totally bomb. Like, it's one thing for an indie not to make a lot of money. It's another thing for a $100 million Steven Spielberg vehicle to not make a lot of money. It's true. Um, but, you know, uh, Power of the Dog obviously had a lot going for it. It had nominees and Best Actor and Best Actress. And that didn't have Best Actress nominee, but I mean, it had, it's important it had a bunch of noms. Like, it had a lot going on. So it's hard to say that they didn't at least like what was going on here. I, I'm, you know, look. Honestly, ever since I watched the piano back in school, I, I've been middling on Jane Campion. I still kind of am. <laughs> I just am. Like she's okay. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, uh, but she's now a two-time Academy Award not winning director. So like she's clearly better than I think she is. I think I need to go back and maybe revisit her movies and uh deliver us from the power of Jane Campion. Yeah, like somebody, somebody, please write into the show and explain to me like what I, what I don't see uh, in 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 her in her movies because I think she's she, I think she's all right. Like I think she's all right. Um, you know. Uh, any thoughts on this one, Andy? Uh, about international feature or movie? Uh, did you talk about? Did you say best director? I don't remember if you. Yes, I did say. Okay, well then, it, well to tell you what, let me down, bounce down to international feature. Uh, best international feature went to Drive My Car. 
which we're really excited to have seen and a little bit excited to talk about. Other nominees include The Hand of God, Flea, that was that animated feature Andy mentioned, uh, Lunana, A Yak in the Classroom, and The Worst Person in the World, which is another movie I heard a little bit about, um, but have not seen. Andy, you've seen one of these. <laughs> it happens to be yeah. there. What do, you, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we'll t- talk about it a little bit later. Yeah, Drive My Car is yeah. phen- phenomenal. It's, it's, I mean, it's very long. It's a full three hours. Um, it is a really... Uh, incredible piece of work i feel like it's better be suited for like a tv miniseries because uh there's nothing from it that i would cut i could i couldn't think of any section that you could leave out it's all really important there's just no. so much of it it feels like it could have been like an hbo three-part or something like and they could have put it on there where people like seem to respect like series and movies a little bit more and i think it would have had some real buzz but um we'll talk about it more uh, briefly after our fresh review uh best supporting actress andy Ariana DuBose uh, won for West Side Story, her portrayal of Anita. Uh, she was a huge favorite, big front runner. She's incredible in that movie. She's got to sing, and dance, and act, speak English and Spanish. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, and she's already on Broadway as well, so not, not surprising. Uh, other nominees were Kirsten Dunst for The Power of the Dog, Jesse Buckley, Her Lost Daughter, Judy Dench for Belfast, and uh, Anjanae Ellis for King Richard. Um, I think she was the front runner far and away. I, I, I did say last week, man, it'd be really cool if Jesse Buckley won, but I didn't think it was going to happen because it was a pretty small role. Uh, Anita's role is very much larger, so much so that this is the first character um, on both sides of the film's timeline that, that our, our actress who plays Anita has won an Oscar. Right, Rita Moreno won it for way back in the day. Our editor Bose has won it today. Both playing the same character. Crazy. Never happened before in film. Uh, just goes to show how far we've come with our sequels and remakes. Congrats to Ariana DeVos. She's super good in it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next up, Best Supporting Actor went to Troy Coetzer from CODA. Yes. Uh, other nominees include Sierra Hines from Belfast, Cody Smith McPhee from The Power of the Dog, J.K. Simmons from Being the Ricardos, and Jesse Plemons in The Power of the Dog. Uh, we've only seen one of these, but technically that means we've seen two performances in this category. Yes, two of them from The Power of the Dog. Andy, any thoughts on Troy Coetzer taking it away? Again, a big favorite. He'd won some of the other awards. It's a really big, important. Uh, it's the first time a deaf actor has won uh, Best Supporting Actor award uh and also surprising again it won over two two people for again the power of the dog all these nominations and only one win uh like i said I, but i was i was surprised that jesse Plemons was nominated because he's he's it's he's kind of a boring nothing role i, I was like i don't think he really had to stretch i think he just had to show up and a, say bo- a boring nothing role excuse me sir he plays he plays um no, I don't want to talk about. It. You know, I don't want to get in there. He's like a, a banker, a rancher. He's he's the uh, he's he's like the voice of reason to uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is very yeah. kind of angry cowboy. So it's, it's he's it's, he's got to have like twenty six minutes of screen time in that movie total. Yeah. Like yeah, he's really not in that. Much. Yeah, Cody Cody Smith McPhee is really the standout performance between those two. Yeah. Um, congrats to Troy Kutzer. From what I heard from the, from the few people I know that saw Coda, everybody said he was super good in it. Like his character is really likable and really funny. So, um, you know, hey, good for him. I, I don't know if this is his first time acting. I think it was. Um, always weird to see a first time actor take it away from people who've been doing it for years, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have much more to say about it. Uh, our next our next uh, category. Well, hold on. I just said the last one. Andy, you want to? Uh, best documentary feature. Went to Summer of Soul uh, by a uh, Quest Love, uh, which was it's I haven't seen it. It's about a uh, basically R and B festival from the sixties. I've heard it's really good, really phenomenal. I haven't seen it. Uh, other nominees were oh, I just lost it. Uh, Ascension, uh, which I've heard some about. Flea, Attica, and Riding with Fire. Um, I don't know any of these i haven't seen any of them normally i try to be up on documentary a little bit more but i do know that obviously flea has three really unique nominations and summer of souls available on hulu so if you have it you can go check it out uh i i wish i'd seen it so i could say more but you know i look i'm i, I love a good documentary i don't watch them i don't watch them enough I, I should um so yeah that's that's that uh can i skip live action short film do, do yeah we... yes yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, best original screenplay went to Belfast from Kenneth Branagh. Other nominees included the worst person in the world. That was that one nominated for uh, best international feature. Don't look up on Netflix. Licorice Pizza from Paul Thomas Anderson and King Richard. 
on HBO. Uh, we have not seen Belfast. Uh, I, 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 the writing must trying, be pretty good. <laughs> we keep trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's a little like, um, God, the movie I always compare it to is that best picture nom for a couple from a couple years ago called the father starring Anthony Hopkins, where people said it was one of his best performances in his life. And it's still like eight bucks to rent it. It does not exist on a streaming service. So I'll just never see it, I guess. Um, Cause I'm not going to pay to watch a movie. that has been out for three years, you know, like we're, come on, that should be rolled into my Netflix subscription. I, I'm a consumer. That's that's pro consumer. Andy, what do you think of best original screenplay? Um, I, again, I haven't seen it. Uh, some of these, again, don't look up. I don't think is very good. I haven't seen like rich pizza. I, I have heard things about good things about worst, uh, worst person in the world. And then uh, of course, uh, I mean, I didn't think very much of the King Richard movie personally, but yeah, it was, all, it, of, was yeah. it was all right. Yeah. I thought it was a solid streaming joint. You know, if I feel like if it's seen in theaters, I would have been like, eh, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. If you're like, eh, why is it getting a nomination? It's true. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Uh, best adapted screenplay went to Coda. Um, other nominees included The Lost Daughter, Dune, Dune, my Arrakis, Dune. Uh, Drive My Car, and uh, The Power of the Dog. Uh, once again, The Power of the Dog getting shut out. Uh, the Lost Daughter, which we we did see, good movie, but it was uh, also kind of a struggle to get through. Dune would have been my favorite pick. Uh, I didn't realize Drive My Car was. Um, oh yeah, they do say it's a short story. So Coda, another big that's a big win for that again, little film with a lot of the big awards. Um, Dune's really weird. I, I don't know how that didn't take it. I mean, Coda must have a really good adapted script. People said for 30 years that Dune was an unfilmable movie. And even the David Lynch version, a lot of people had complaints with because they said it didn't really work. There have been uh, gestures towards how to make that film for literal decades uh, and leading up to a documentary made about one from Alejandro Hodorowsky called Hodorowsky's Dune. Even that didn't get made because this movie was so hard to make. Not only did Denis Villeneuve manage to make an adaptation of Dune that's really good, uh, it won six other awards that we haven't gotten to yet. I'm really surprised that didn't get best adapted screenplay because if the, if 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 the skill is the best at adapting a screenplay into a film, I don't understand how filming the unfilmable isn't that thing, especially when it wins a bunch of awards. But hey, well, Coda's probably pretty good too. I'm not bitter about it. I'm not mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other it's, thing it's is, that, you know, uh, ideally you want to reward films that are yeah. memorable and have had some sort of cultural impact. I guarantee you, in six months or a year, no one's going to re remember Coda. Uh, yeah we'll see so my, uh, that, my but, there'll be more th a lot of the, th the thinking is that if dune part two will get a lot of the bigger awards when it comes out in 2023 i laugh every time Dad, andy says my arrakis gets me every time <laughs> uh best makeup and hairstyling goes to the eyes of tammy Faye. uh this is jessica chastain takes another one additional nominees included cruella dune house of gucci and coming to america from amazon prime studios that's a sequel to coming to america like obviously yep. the, the old one uh what do you think andy uh so uh, yeah I, i've heard that her makeup took like four hours to do uh, yeah. for, and it's like Jim Carrey it's, and the Grinch. Yeah, she, it took her a lot of time to. Well, she used that time to really get into the character. Um, is from what I heard. Uh, Cru, it was really gr great in Cru Cruella, honestly. Um, which actually got an award for best costume design. I am Loki excited. Uh, Cruella got best costume, but we'll get down to that in a minute. Uh, next up, best visual effects uh, went to Dune. Dune. Uh, <laughs> this is right. Um. Not surprised there is one of the big, uh, you know, special effects blockbusters of the year. Other nominations were Spider Man No Way Home, Free Guy, No Time to Die, and Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Uh, kind of surprised that Spider Man didn't get it just because, you know, Spider Man's was so huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised Spider Man didn't get it because of the absurd amount of green screen they used in Spider Man No Way Home. <laughs> You'd think like at some point they just get it like uh, as an honorary, but honestly, I'm glad. Uh, I think you know it's funny since since these two got nominated. I was reading an article just last week about how Marvel is leaning way too much on like full blue screen green screen sets um, mm -hmm. and not building enough practical work. And and Dune was really the opposite of that dune felt so tangible even though a lot of it was cga like cg like they just used a lot of really basic methods to put sand on screen and then green screen behind it to make it look like there's layers of sand in front of our actors like even you know using big props to, to tell sm shoot small scenes miniatures like there's a lot going on in dune to kind of present that that kind of sh 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 
that, that wonderful movie that it is. Uh, you know, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad Dune's getting some love. Uh, yeah, that's 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 what I got to say about it, I guess. Uh, uh, best, any other thoughts on this one? No, going on. Uh, yeah. Best original score also went to Dune Han, for Hans Zimmer. Um, this was one of the best scores of the of the year, easily. Um, I've added it to our our soundtrack uh, playlist. Uh, phenomenal work. Uh, other nominees were Encanto, Don't Look Up, The Power of the Dog, and Parallel Mothers. I don't know how par- how Don't Look Up is on there because like I cannot. I yeah. have no idea what the score. You, like so, there's zero zero anything memorable in Kanto, obviously it's a musical very good yeah power of the dog uh is johnny greenwood who also did the uh score for uh there will be blood uh it's all, always very modern um kind of thing and we i didn't see parallel mothers again why is don't look up even in anywhere near know. these awards I, I can't hum a single bar of music from don't look up i, I don't also for screenplay half that movie's improv but whatever i'm glad dune got it i'm bummed uh han zimmer wasn't invited to the oscars uh because this was one of those uh pre-tape segments so oh, his no, first oscar win in 30 plus years he wasn't even in the country i don't think <laughs> so like bummer Ooh. like i don't i don't know yeah he's, he's he's only one of the greatest film composers we have um but hey, good for him. I'm glad he won. Uh, looking forward to, to what's next uh, from him and also from Doom. I'm going to skip Best Animated Short. I'm going to skip Best Short Documentary. I'm going to jump right into Best Cinematography. I went to Dune. Uh, additional nominees included The Tragedy of Macbeth, Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, and West Side Story. All films we've seen. All pretty solid picks, wouldn't you say, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say all the, especially Nightmare Alley, which we've seen in, in black and white, phenomenal cinematography. The, um, the Tragedy of Macbeth, which is almost like a stage play, but a lot of it looks kind of like a comic book. Really well done. Some really, the- really clever shooting in a small budget scenario. Like a lot of really cool stuff in the Tragedy of Macbeth. Uh, the Power of the Dog, you know, a, it's a Western out in Montana. A lot of really interesting landscape shots. And West Side Story was also done really well. Some, you know, that's one thing Spielberg kind of can do is he can come up with some really original looking shots yes west side story is really there's some really good cinematography going on in there but of all of my like dune like dude dune was my favorite dune was the one that made me feel like uh you know arrakis is a real place like and that's not easy to do you know um more so than than tatooine ever felt real in, in my humble opinion <laughs> so uh, you know, my Arrakis. Uh, best costume design goes to. Wait, well, I just did cinematography. Andy, please. Uh, best costume design went to Cruella. Uh, hey! which starred Emma <laughs> Emma Stone as uh, the titular character. Um, with phenomenal costume in there. There's a scent. There's kind of a fashion battle <laughs> that happens between her and Emma Thompson's character, and it's a really interesting. Um, film really really great costuming. Uh, other nominees were Nightmare Alley, Dune, uh, Cyrano, and West Side Story. Also, all great com- uh, costumes. We didn't see Cyrano. Uh, we did not see Cyrano. I wanted to. Uh, from Joe Wright, director of Pride and Prejudice, 2004 and Atonement. Uh, I think the thing I liked about the outfits in Cruella, the things that the costumes that really stood out to me, like I feel like so many movies that are trying to show a a a lofty goal for a a a crafty character on screen will often miss the mark but they'll do their best right like uh, in bill and ted face the music when they had to write the song that saved the world it's not going to be the best song ever of course it isn't so what they end up doing is some kind of cheesy you know melody that kind of works for the movie and you just go along with okay yeah that's going to be the song that everybody likes even though it's a totally mediocre tune nobody remembers cruella goes the other way our fashionistas are trying to out design each other and they're designing like met gala level costumes and they're all super cool like i remember watching corella and thinking dude the costumes in this are outstanding so i'm glad it got nominated i'm glad it won they're really good uh, go check out corella on disney plus there's anything i can say about the movies costumes were super good so you know hey well done Best film editing went to Dune, uh, another winner for Dune. Uh, the nominees included The Power of the Dog, Don't Look Up, Tick, Tick, Boom, and King Richard. Um, Dune is pretty... The film editing is a tough thing. All right, because film editing is you never it's hard to nail down. A lot of people don't it's know. Where, what, it's what where it means all the cuts are made, editing. right? Yeah, it's it's almost how you feel when you watch the movie. Like when you feel suspense uh, at a scary scene and hereditary, that's almost all because of film editing, the way it's put together and the way it's constructed on screen to make you see and experience something like when you feel 
love when you watch a romance movie that's what that is so i think film editing says this is the one that made us the most elated this is the one that put us in our seats and made us feel like we were in another world um and dune was really good at that so it, it draws you in doesn't let go uh, best production design went to Dune as well. Other nominees were Nightmare Alley, The Power of the Dog, Tragedy of Macbeth, West Side Story. A lot of these are like the same, like Dune won, and it was the same four nominees. Yes. Uh, but yes, great, great staging, great, you know, the different planets and locations are made to feel very, very real, um, well deserved. And finally, and finally, best sound. Best sound, yes, goes to Dune. Uh, other nominees include West Side Story, Belfast, The Power of the Dog, No Time to Die. Dude, those ships taking off, that sand blowing, those giant sandworms, that's all sound, baby. That stuff works. That brings you in. Dune walks away with six wins at the Academy Awards. Uh, not no. too shabby. I think that was the most of anyone. I think it was the most of anyone. Um, God, and there we are at the end of the Oscars. Andy, what do you think? 94th Academy Awards uh from the winners and losers and the snubs i don't know overall impressions i, I mean I, I didn't feel anyone was really snubbed or ups, i did uh, <laughs> who was who was snubbed denis villeneuve he didn't even get well, nominated for best well, director right, my god but of, but of the nominees um oh okay, okay. you know uh i mean my, it was just kind of weak the, the, of who they chose for a lot of the top awards like the the acting awards were, were a a load of weak films. Half of the best picture noms were kind of weak. And we mentioned a number of really great films that didn't get any recognition or, or nomination. So it's just, it's strange sometimes. Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they kind of get it right. And uh, But all anyone's ever going to remember is the, is the slap. Is the slap. Yeah. The, sl the slap heard around the world. That's going to be that's going to be the thing. Uh, it's a shame it has to go that way. Right. I, I hope in the future our, our Oscar... <laughs> Oscar attendees and uh, maybe hang on to a little composure, even when they're excited about winning or potentially losing security. Um, yeah, I hope I, I, I assume that they will just bar off the front of the stage now, right? Like nobody, nobody walks up that way. Like that's not, nobody's going to rush Who the stage knows? ever. And uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe they'll be a little wiser next year. Any, any, uh, any, any snubs for anybody that wasn't nominated, Andy, I'm going to throw you two, three. I mean, One, obviously, uh, yeah. yeah. Denny Villeneuve's the big. I'm going to say two, David Lowry for The Green Knight. Criminal that it got no, no, no nominations. And three, and I'll only throw one. All right, I'm just going to throw one nom at Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch for production design. That's it. Those I could get on board with that. I would I would yeah. also, I would raise you a uh, Julia Durkanel for Teton, <sighs> uh, which, which should have gotten the best. Too hot. It, too hot yeah, for the Oscars. That, <laughs> it, it is. It's, it's, too, it's too bold. For, um, oh. no, that should have gotten best international. No, a nomination for best international film 100 percent should have gotten the nomination for best international that that good god i felt like i was on a roller coaster like that since i watched hereditary um titan good stuff and that's the that's the oscars that's the academy awards uh we're here at the end of it we're looking forward to the 95th next year and if you want to keep it here on oscar for more or hear any of our old oscars coverage just go scrolling back through our stuff and while you're at it hit that subscribe button and uh let us know you swung by with the rating and review and with that we should move into normally i plug the show at the end sorry with that we should move into our review for the episode uh and you want to say I didn't, I didn't we didn't work out the summary hold on Wait a Fred, second. Bit of, bit, of, bit of on. I, I can do it. do it. I can. Okay. I can. Okay. I, th I think I can do it. I, I think I got it because I watched it like yesterday. Yeah, uh, the movie is uh, fresh. So fresh is the story of Noah, a young woman who is dating in Portland and having no luck. She's been on Tinder. She's been on Bumble. She's got a really supportive friend, but she just hasn't found the right guy yet. Everybody's a jerk. And then she goes on a wonderful date uh, with a young doctor, a plastic surgeon named Steve. And uh, after just a weekend of love and flirting and fun and, you know, maybe a little staying over and getting you know, breakfast the next morning. Uh, Steve whisks her away for the weekend uh, to his cabin in the woods to uh, uh, give them a great weekend out. And suddenly <laughs> upon arrival, Noah finds out uh, Steve is not who he says he is. And things are, are not at all the way they seem. And suddenly Fresh becomes a very different kind of movie. Uh, the movie is available on Hulu. It is an hour 54. Uh, this is a recommendation from Andy after he saw it a few weeks ago. Andy, what'd you think of Fresh? 
Brush is a fun little horror movie. It's um, you, you know, what did we we watch? Um, uh, Kimmy was we was a small kind of straight to streaming film we watched a couple weeks ago and it it felt like a straight to streaming film it was just it felt really cheap and fresh is definitely on a budget it's kind of a bottle film mostly takes place uh in, inside this creeper's house uh but it feel felt so different it was a much more engaging interesting story it cared a lot more about the characters it, it does that thing of like it should there's a lot of off-screen kind of violence or off-screen you know, horror that, that you have to imagine. Uh, and so it, it, it's a good way of keeping the budget down and still being uh, scary. Uh, we have Sebastian Stan doing a, a really good, uh, just like kind of crazy lead. And uh, da- so this was the first time I've heard of this actress, Daisy Edgar Jones. And now she's like everywhere. Like I, I, saw, <laughs> I saw her in like three trailers for upcoming movies. Um, yeah, she's in that new movie where the crawdads sing. Which I yeah. think is probably going to be her breakout because that's going to be theatrical. She's done a bunch of TV, I think. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is her first like feature, as far as I can tell. Um, and, and she's really good. Good too. The the story is nice and creepy and touches a little bit on you know some class consciousness. Um, yeah, it was a good, nice little film, and uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, Fresh is a a unique feature. Um, Fresh does something that Drive My Car does that I think is worth talking about. I don't think it's a spoiler. Um, Both of these movies drop their title cards late, Um, which is, (laughs) okay, listen. On the one hand, it can be a gimmick, okay? (laughs) On the other hand, it could be a a, a new film technique that I absolutely love. Dude, I fall, uh, both these movies. The second those title cards came up, like the biggest shit-eating grin comes across my face, and I feel like I'm in in for something new. Um, It's so cheesy, but it works so good, and it takes a turn right at the half-hour mark. Uh, into an area that it did not seem like it was going to go. And I tried to be smart. I tried to not watch any trailers. I didn't look up any summaries or anything. I just went in as fresh as I could. Um, and I'll be honest, that first half hour is a little bit of a struggle. <laughs> in my in my opinion, um, I'm not dating. And I, I think it does a really good job of capturing this feeling of hopelessness when you're dating around and on tinder and not getting anywhere and meeting people who are just weird and talking to your friends and being uncomfortable about it and then maybe finding somebody you kind of like and trying to be honest and open with them like it does a really good job of nailing that down uh pretty early um but man once they get out to the cabin uh it turns into another beast yeah well um especially sans character is a little bit too good to be true he's like a doctor and but he's like really nice he's not a jerk and he, like, he's obviously very wealthy he's got this you know drives a tesla has this really really nice house and uh, all the rest of us are like this this guy's a serial killer like <laughs> right. how, how could this person be single and be so charismatic and dateable but like yeah it doesn't add up like it's just something from the from the jump that seems weird but, but that's i mean that's how horror movies are you know they're going to their doom uh yeah uh, essentially uh but yeah once we get the to his um lair or or home that's where yeah things uh take a turn (laughs) yeah they certainly do um i was surprised at the body horror in this movie uh like i said i don't don't want to give away what exactly is going on um but you can obviously you can obviously suspect that our guy steve is maybe preying on young women in the city and that's a pretty apt apt analysis Uh, and when you find out what's what he's doing with them (laughs) and what's going on uh, it's not it's not it's not particularly nice and there's there's a bit of um yeah body horror i'm, I'm gonna leave it at that that is just uncomfortable because the movie like really plays it almost like a comedy gag like it's it's it, there's a lot of music in the movie a lot of pop and it's kind yeah. of like played off almost for a laugh and it's weird it's weird tonally and it doesn't really work but at the same time like when you're watching something horrifying and the tone is off it feels even more unsettling so i don't know if it was intentional or not but from director mimi cave i think it, it was it's uniquely presented some of the some of the scenes in this film that are a little bit more 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 painful to watch well also you, you could see where you know a larger budget of this movie would have you could lean into it a lot more. You could make it like saw level or like hostile kind of, it lends itself to that level of like gore. Um, but it, 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 it strays away from that because I think it's a smaller budget movie and you know, there are yeah insinuations of, of body horror, but a lot, of, it's not shown near as much as it would be kind of in a mainstream movie. 
It's true. And that's not easy to do. Um, I remember watching this and I told you it reminded me of seeing the pre previews for that 2019 film Swallow um, about a woman who yeah, swallows household objects, starting with like a thumbtack. And, and it's oh, just, I remember. Oh, God. Like, yeah. Like just just even even though, you know, it's a film and, you know, it's not real, like just the idea of it in it presented in the right fashion can like really push you over the edge. I never saw that movie because it would creep me out too much. And Fresh doesn't quite wander in that category, but definitely, definitely similar vibes and points. It's like, my, my God, like this is, <laughs> this is really unsettling. So, um, and I was pleased that it's able to present that, like you said, on a really small budget. That's just tone, man. That's some good editing, some good direction, some quality cinematography. You pace those scenes out nice and well. And before you know it, your audience's skin is crawling because they feel like what they're seeing is representative of an idea so frightening that it's gross, right? Like you just associate it. It's almost like Titan kind of does the same thing in certain bits, like really, really effective filmmaking and on a budget, on a tight budget. It's good stuff. Yeah, it reminded me. So it's got a little bit of the theme of like women working together, but also women devouring each other to survive. And uh, I, I rewatched the uh, the Neon Demon, the Nicholas Winding Refn film uh, just a couple of days ago. And that has a similar um, people eating, basically eating each other to not literally, but to get on top, to survive, to one up each other. It's a little bit of that. I never watched that movie. Would you recommend it? Absolutely. I haven't yeah, seen it. I haven't, I haven't seen it since I watched it the first time in like 2014 or whatever. And it's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. That was a real big swing after um, there were walk. There were walkouts. <laughs> yeah. Right. Everybody thought it was going to be drive two. And it's like, no, no, this is not, this is not what's going on there. Yeah. Then he made only God forgives. That was, that was weird too. Maybe I'll switch those. Either way, um, I liked Sebastian Stanton's movie. I, I know you talk about performances a little bit already, but like he's really charming. He's clearly, I mean, I, the, the front he's runner here. Fun. Like, yeah, like, and he he knows what it is, and and he's having a good time. And Sebastian Stan's an actor that like I'm kind of just middling on, but it's pleasant when they can turn out a performance that is, you know captivating like you're pretty much glued to the screen when he's on screen like you're you're pretty much paying attention to what he's doing and and that's good stuff additionally uh daisy edgar jones i think is her name right yep yep uh yeah she's great i'm excited to see her in her next movie like it seems like we had a couple of solid up-and-comers uh it's a couple of additional cast members uh in this movie who are not as prominently featured everybody's pretty good um but overall it's uh it's a solid little streaming feature and i'm, I'm impressed that how much they were able to do with simple sets, right? It does, you don't move around a lot. Once once you get out to the cabin, that's where most of the film is taking place. Um, you know, so low budget, simple sets, and 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 quality camera work. Lots of tripods, lots of locked down shots. Not a lot of handheld in this movie. Like it, it feels like everything's very thought out, storyboarded. Everything was very planned, um, and that makes you know your your kind of criminal mastermind in the film all that more exciting to watch because it feels like the film is just right. as controlled as he is. The only one, there's one thing that took me out of it is, you know, anytime he's like scrubbed up and in like the surgery theater, I'm like, you know, he would need an assistant. I don't think he could do this all on his own. <laughs> he would yeah. Need to, he would need some, several people. Right. But, yeah. And it's, he, yeah, he's, he's got this kind of level of, of psychosis about him where, yeah, he's, he, he throws on surgery scrubs for stuff. And it's just like one, not only do you probably not even need those, but two, yeah, typically that would imply you doing this with another group of people. Like why you, you're basically doing this at home. Like, why aren't you just doing it in shorts and a t-shirt for God's sake? You should look like you're mowing the lawn. <laughs> What's God. the difference? But you know what? Yeah. It's neither here nor there. Uh, it's good for the film, I guess. Look, looks good. Um, shoot. Any other thoughts for recommendations? I meant for this one to be a quick one. We, we, yeah. we wanted to, you know, yeah, kind of I'm, uh, I'm, soon. I'm ready. Uh, Andy, would you recommend fresh? Yeah, I would. It's, it's a fun little movie, horror movie. It's, you know, what they've, started calling bottle films where it primarily takes place in one location very small cast very shoestring cast and budget and all that and it's still it's fun it's entertaining uh if you've had to do an it, you know be exist in the modern dating world uh, you'll get a kick out of it uh for sure it definitely takes a lot of jabs at that um good performances from our li our lead sebastian stan and daisy edgar jones so uh yeah definitely recommend and that's on hulu uh yes it is available on hulu yeah not bad i i mean normally if i'd seen it in theaters i might say save it for streaming but good news it's already there that's exactly where it's supposed to be and i think it does a great job of doing what it is on that platform if you have hulu check out fresh um content warning yeah it's a little violent 
<laughs> so if you're watching with somebody squeamish, maybe maybe not super into it. It's not mega gore, but a lot of it is implied, and that stuff will, you know, that's that stuff can keep you up at night if you're in the wrong headspace for it. So uh, fresh, not a bad feature. And uh, one more thing before we wrap the show this week. Uh, since Andy had already seen Fresh, I, I kind of cornered him into finally watching uh, Drive My Car, <laughs> the winner of this year's Best International <laughs> Feature. Uh, and and so I'm glad that he uh, appeased me and actually watched it. It was long. I'm glad he did, though. And like I said at the top of the show, I watched this uh, during episode uh, 166. I talked about Drive My Car. Um, so if you want to hear more from me on that, we could talk about that. But for now, just a brief conversation. Andy, um, tell me about Drive My Car, man. What do you think? So I thought it was really good. It's this really kind of strange relationship drama, a man recovering, dealing with the, the death of his wife. Part of the reason it's so long is that the what is essentially the first act, the first 35, 40 minutes, would normally just be like the opening scene, the opening five minutes of, of a movie. But it, they, it takes its time, like, because uh, basically the uh, his wife dies at the end of Act One, but you get a whole thirty half hour forty minutes of their relationship establishing kind of where they are, and it's very uh, they're very close. It's very intimate, um, and it's also very tragic when uh, she just kind of passes out of, out of nowhere, and it's so then he struggles. Um, well, it kind of jump, jumps ahead to two years later, but he's he's been asked to you know direct this play that he's famously always played the lead in, um, and he does. It's a unique recreation where all the characters are speaking different languages, including um, sign language. Uh, so you know, it's about relationships. It's a uh, it's about uh, family. Uh, there's other characters struggling in, in different ways. Uh, one, one of the actors uh, he works with is you know also in love with the same woman and has also had problems with his public life and there, there's so much going on in this movie but it's just so long it's a full three hours like i said yeah. I, watch watching the yes. chunks but like act two is like almost two hours long it's a lot yeah um so andy has said nothing wrong here um and i agree with pretty much everything um i thought the world of this movie i, I thought it was really unique i feel terrible for dragging my wife to see it because I, I know she was bored she liked it but um it's 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 just too long it's the one thing i wish i could change about it they either need to cut a half hour somewhere um which they could do because there are definitely some scenes that go long here um or yeah like split it into parts um it's on hbo so if you want to watch it you should and you can watch it in halves that's the way i'd probably say to do it um or maybe in like three sections but um i really i really think the world is movie yeah I, I think i think what's going on in it is really good it just it lacks a certain like i i don't know a, a, a certain emotional flair like a, a, a climactic ending that that makes you yeah, go out and tell tell all the world about it i mean like it, it reminds me of the first half of like parasite in that it's it's good and it makes me kind of twirl my mustache and think man this is really great cinema but then parasite takes a turn and by the time you leave the theater you're like i need to text everybody i know and tell them to go see this movie drive my car doesn't quite do that it doesn't expect you to it, it has more to say about this kind of universal language of love and loss and grief and handling grief and despair um, than it does to <laughs> give you any kind of climactic end with big action or anything. And that's okay. Um, I really like what it's doing though. I, I like what this movie has to say about language. Um, and I wanted to see if you had any, any, any unique musings on that, Andy. Well, the uh, only that you know, language is more than just well, what is said. It's a lot of what's, you know, body language, what's seen and heard and, those i mean that's that's a big part of it too you know one of the actors in the movie is um is mute but not deaf uh and she speaks korean sign language in um, in the midst of all the rest of these actors who are also speaking japanese chinese uh tagalog english um it's really it's a, it's, it's a really unique uh thing but it feels yeah. a lot more like a stage play a lot of times it does yeah for sure um and 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 the, the stage play in the film is an actual stage play um but they don't they don't actually present much of that they just kind of give you a few key scenes they don't really tell you like here's what's going on so i'm sure that's worth reading into on the back end but yeah I, I i like the way these characters have to interact with each other without speaking the same language all going off a script though all, all going off what they are told to say like by the director in the film 
and and then working off of each other's kind of just body emotions from that and like it, it's subtle but it works like and, and if you're kind of tuned into what drive my car is doing like you can really see the patience um that the filmmaker had the filmmakers had to have to get that to come across on screen and i, I think it works really well um but that patience comes at a cost and that is a really long run time yeah. um which I don't dislike. Again, I, I will probably go rewatch this film at some point. I, I really thought it was neat. Additionally, um, a couple other quick thoughts. Um, it's a beautiful film. Lots of lots of really wide wide angle lenses of Japan. Lots of scenery. Obviously, lots of this red Saab uh, driving down down the road. This car uh, in, in Tishula drive my car. Um, it's very well presented, and our actors and actresses are fantastic. A lot of people said uh, Ryusuke Hamaguchi, uh, the uh, lead in this movie, got snubbed this year for best actor. I don't. I can't say for sure, but he's really good in it. Um, what do you think, Andy? I thought it was fine. I actually have to go soon, though, so we need to wrap up. Mm. Time to wrap up the show, then. Uh, Andy, what are we watching next week? All right. So next week, uh, well, we're off because Zach is traveling, but uh, the big release is Morbius finally on April 1st. It's not a April Fool's joke, but the uh, Jared Leto superhero film, Morbius, where he's part doctor, part vampire, uh, that's the big release. Uh, we we won't. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, and we're also going to try and see everything everywhere all at once, uh, which I th- think we'll be getting a wide release by then. And uh, the other big release on April eighth is uh, Ambulance and Sonic the Hedgehog two. Yes, which we may end up seeing again at some point as well. If you enjoyed the show today, if you want to hear our future reviews or maybe weigh in on our older Oscar stuff, you want to tell us what you thought of this Will Smith slapping Chris Rock thing, uh, email us at mail at oscriptfilmreview.com. You can check out our website, oscriptfilmreview.com, for full episodes. You can find us on Facebook where we live stream the show every Tuesday. We're on YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. And you can find us in all those usual places as well, as well as audio platforms like itunes google play spotify iHeartMedia, we're all over and the biggest thing you could do to help your boys here at off script is just subscribe and i've plugged it like twice during the show sorry i know i didn't lay off of it but it would really help us if you did subscribing is a big help for little podcasts like ours and you could also leave us a rating and review that help a ton too just drop five stars down there and let us know how we did on the show so we can get better and then we can give you you know film reviews every single week so keep it here on off script for more from all of us at off script the home of bold cinema i'm zach lewis and i'm dr draper Thanks for watching.